Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 717. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's February 11th, 2022. Welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could join us. As you know, you have responsibilities, and I don't want to talk about them a lot, so I just put them here on the screen. Pay attention. You'll see one that says like. You'll see the one that says subscribe. And those are just opportunities for you to give freely to Anglican Unscripted uh, your likes. It's like donating. What could I donate to Kevin and George today? A like. You know, just, when will he stop talking about this? I don't know. When I get around to it. Um, so please... Go to the comment section. A lot of great comments on our last couple episodes, and we appreciate that. Uh, the conversation does not stop when George and I click the stop button. It stops when you guys stop commenting, and you guys should never, ever, ever, ever do that. George, how you been doing? I'm just fine. My wife's off in Philadelphia to take care of some family business, so it's yeah. just me and two dogs in the office today. Uh, we've been delayed in our start of our show because Julia saw somebody outside and has been protecting us. Yes. And while doing so, Jasper has stolen the one dog bed. So uh, we may have some ar arguments a little later in the show when Julius uh, re realizes he's lost the prime spot in the room. Oh, no. So uh, another beautiful day here in Florida. The sun is shining. There's not a cloud out there in the sky. In fact, there's no wind. All the flags are just uh, lying flat but against the poles. So... Uh, it should be a good show, except one thing you probably don't have in Wisconsin or Maine or Washington today is pollen. Pollen is very prevalent today here in Florida. So my voice is like an octave and a half deeper. The nasal cavities are full of gunk, and that's, you're just going to have to deal with that. We, we appreciate your patience. George, let's go here to the stories. I'm looking here. Um, we reported last couple episodes that there's going to be a conclave in South Carolina that has been postponed for what reason COVID who knows what reason um, so they, they're not able to get all the archbishops together archbishops bishops together and meet to discuss uh, church for the sake of others so we'll have to see what happens in the future with that um, I'm assuming there'll be another conclave because it wasn't canceled but it, it's really an important topic George I'm, I'm encouraged to see Archbishop Foley Beach calling a conclave Yep. Uh, it was scheduled for the after the consecration of Chip Edgar. Mm -hmm. And yes, no S in Edgar. Edgar, not Edgar's. <laughs> Do we not know what unscripted oh. means? Come on. <laughs> yes. Well, we make those mistakes from time to time. time. Absolutely. And a after the consecration, the bishops, the AC, and I were going to meet at Camp Christopher to thrash out of uh, the C4SO problem, the reform led by the Reformed Episcopal Church, but not exclusively. Some members of the College of Bishops are concerned about the theological underpinnings and tone of some of the work coming out of the C4SO mm -hmm. on uh, critical race theory, on human sexuality, other issues. And so Foley Beach had called a meeting where he wanted at least 90% of the bishops to be there. And it was going to be a quiet meeting, conclave, no press, no reports afterwards, but basically to allow the face-to-face -face discussion of these issues rather than discussion through third parties like Kevin and George. Well, one of the biggest things Well, I don't think they reached the 90% level. No, no, well, I don't know. One of the things I see is there's always that they mean well. You know, they're just trying to be a little bit more innovative, just be patient. Um, they, they mean well, and they're, they're not trying to do anything wrong here. Well, meaning well really uh, makes the doctrine flexible. And we don't want the ACNA's doctrine or the doctrine of the Anglican Communion to be flexible. Uh, the doctrine is well, a hard, solid uh, core principle of what we believe, George. Well, it's, it's, the, it's the problem we're seeing. It's not restricted to the ACNA. It's part of the Episcopal Church. Yeah. It's part of the U.S. government. It's uh, We can be flexible when Antifa burns down federal court buildings and tries to assault the Department of Homeland Security. Yeah. Oh, you know, they're just young. They, you know, we'll let them pass. Uh, you get a bunch of MAGA uh, types uh, trespassing. <laughs> they're treated as if uh, 
They're the Rose, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Julius and Ethel, Ethel Rosenberg. They're going to be executed <laughs> for nuclear sabotage. So, you know, we have unequal application of laws in the United States based upon your political orientation. Mm -hmm. um, and the Anglican world, it's always been liberals get as much slack as they want. Uh, it's you're not allowed to have gay blessings or gay ordinations. Well, the Episcopal Church will go ahead and do it. And if the bishops are brought up on trial, well, they meant well. They did. Uh, yeah. The other direction, Bill Love doesn't follow a resolution. Mm -hmm. He gets hammered, you know. Well, uh, and so at, in the end of the day, the Orthodox classical Anglicans are not allowed to mutually flourish within the church. That's just, mm -hmm. that's what happens, you know. It's sad. Well, we see that in the church. We see that in the Church of England. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, promises made are never kept to the uh, traditionalists. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Foley Beach is smart enough um, to realize that he has to be even-handed in this and not allow uh, the Anglican way of giving slack to the left and being hard-nosed to the right to overwhelm his church the way it's overwhelmed the Episcopal Church. I mean, look at the flack with the, the dear gay Anglican letter. You know, it meant well. The author meant well. But the author didn't, didn't even see the, the issue until you know, it was brought to his attention. So let's move on to some other stories, George. Um, you and I have discussed ad nauseum the problem with the definition of what a bishop should be doing and what an archbishop should be doing. And there should be accountability within church. So when we see an archbishop and a pope doing what they're supposed to be doing, we will highlight it, praise it, encourage it here on the program. And it was announced by um, Archbishop Justin Welby that he will be going with Pope Francis to South Sudan to promote peace, to meet with the rebel leaders and try w once again, well, I'm just being dramatic here, you know, try once again to bring peace to that nation which has just been gutted by and divided by war and riots and mayhem and i'm like okay cool this is what an archbishop should be doing george one slight correction it oh. was justin welby who said this but it was george and conger and kevin carlson who oh, announced it yeah. Let's Broken. pat ourselves on yes. the shoulder. <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> well, on Sunday, Justin Welby was up in Belfast, uh, Northern Ireland, at, and he was giving a talk, an, inter, inter, an ecumenical talk at the Catholic Cathedral in Belfast. And before the meeting, the Lambeth Palace Press Office released his statement, and we put it up on Anglican Inc. Well, um, we're about five, six hours behind the UK, and so the story was already out on the archbishop's website so i thought well let me just check the film because the venue had put this on youtube and you know so and i was going to say well i'll make it really splashy on our website so that the youtube you could watch it if so the three people mrs welby's you know you know mrs <laughs> welby his mother could watch the video of the archbishop well i put it on and as i was doing the editing work i found that his prepared remarks did not match his actual statement oops and which was actually great for anglican inc because we had a great story and the only ones who reported this on the first few days was the catholic press and anglican inc it's still not up on the uh, anglican communion news site well what's the story welby went off the script and started speaking about his encounter with francis in rome in 2019 Welby and Francis have been working to bring peace to South Sudan, the two largest religious groups in South Sudan, the Anglicans and the Catholics. And so the, their churches that do have a significant input into the life of that country. Well, they had brought the president of South Sudan, plus some rebel leaders, because they had going through a very terrible tribal civil war, at, to Rome. And Francis gave a little homily, and then Welby recounts how Francis, after his homily, knelt and kissed the feet of each of the five Sudanese leaders. And tears came into the eyes of these hardened guerrilla leaders, these military men, even the BBC cameramen. And 
Justin Well Francis at that time and at that place was just exhibiting Christian love and forbearance and forgiveness. Well, well, we said he and Francis have been talking, and in the next few months, they plan on going to Juba, in capital of South Sudan, to meet with the leaders of both sides to plea for peace. And this will be the first joint papal Canterbury visit ever, where they're not, where one is not visiting the other, but they're going as brothers in arms of the Christian faith on a full-scale visit to South Sudan for the Catholics and the Anglicans, but together. This Which is, is wonderful news. Well, it is. It's wonderful because they're not just there to preach peace. They were demonstrating it. Pope Francis mm -hmm. demonstrated peace by kissing uh, the feet of the leaders there. These leaders only know one thing, war. The, Sudan has been in, in generations of war. So when you, you see these leaders who are just, you know, thick-skinned, hard-hearted, um, had one person break through to them, that's demonstrating peace. And I, I just pray, and please, audience, pray uh, that this works. We, we need um, Christianity, we need Jesus, we need transformation to break out in Sudan again. Not just amongst the Anglicans and Catholics, um, but the, the peace and the promise of it needs to be uh, a demonstration where Sudan can be the demonstration for the world of what peace looks like. That's our hope. Indeed. So good job, Pope Francis. Good job, Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. Um, uh, next story. And I love talking about German theologians and German uh, uh, seminaries and now Roman Catholic Germans. It's, it's obviously my favorite topic. You, the Lutherans have been liberal for a long time, but we're having some uh, foray into what the future of the Roman Catholic Church in Germany is going to look like. They got together and had a synod um, and put forth their ideas of what the Vatican should take up as doctrine for the future. And they discussed gay marriage. They discussed uh, a female diaconate, amongst other things. And I want to, in this kind of report we do, talk about the numbers. Because it wasn't a 51% vote, George. It was much more disappointing than that. Give us a story about Roman Catholicism, German edition. The Synodical Assembly of the German Catholic Church met in Frankfurt on Main for four days last week. Mm -hmm. And there are 230 members of their synod, 69 bishops, and then members of the Central Committee of the Catholic Church, were lay in lay ordained ministers, representatives of diocesan clergy, of nuns and monks, youth delegates, uh, representatives of uh, Catholic theological schools, seminaries, so on and so forth. So it's mostly lay people with the bishops, roughly third, a third, a third. Now, not all the bishops were there, only 59 out of the 69 were present. But so much took place in this synod meeting that we didn't even cover all of it in our Anglican Inc. report because, you know, after a certain point, people stop reading and you can only have so much wowie zowie. Well, here are the things that this meeting voted on. And let me give you some of the things. The Synod voted in favor, and I'm going to read this so I get it right. They voted in favor of same-sex blessings, 161 to 34. They asked for a reassessment of the church teaching on homosexuality, 174 to 22. This is where Paul says that those who engage in homosexual behavior will not be accounted among those in the kingdom. Catholic Germans want that to be edited, fixed, you know, make it more appealable. They asked for the ordination of women, deacons, 163 to 42. But the resolution says, now these deacons are not permanent deacons, but transitional, transitional yeah. deacons. So that these can women deacons can then become women priests and then women bishops. They asked that bishops allow priest, current priest, to marry and remain priests without leaving the priesthood, 159 to 26. And then some of the other things that we didn't even bother li listing because, you know, these 
these are enough. They want to change the church's teaching on contraception. You know, right now you're not supposed to use contraception. They want to allow the church, they want to allow good Catholics to use birth control. And they want to rethink the church's position on abortion. Um, these weren't as developed arguments, so I didn't push them. But man, what a... You said, now, the, the future... Kevin, you had a rhetorical question. Where's the future of the uh, Catholic Church going? Sure, yeah, a German, yeah. Looks looks <laughs> like the Episcopal Church to me. I don't well, the, know about you. This is General Convention, uh, the Episcopal Church, 20 years ago. Maybe 30 years ago. Where people were allowed to bring up just the most strangest ideas and doctrines because there was a, a group of bishops says, well, this is going nowhere. And you had the fear and I had the fear that eventually it's going to go somewhere because they'll get the majority. But uh, you've had discussions with bishops who said, no, 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 no. Don't panic because it takes two general conventions for anything serious to happen in the Episcopal Church. Yes, but history, a short-sighted history of 40 years, shows us many bishops will act outside of general convention, not get in trouble, and then general convention will adopt uh, those practices vis-a-vis uh, -vis women clergy. That was never taken up by general convention until they existed. Uh, marrying uh, gay bishops, never taken up until they existed. Uh, you can go one stop, one stop, one stop, uh, all through the history of the last 40 years and find out Innovative bishops in the Episcopal Church were never held accountable, and now chaos reigns at General Convention, George. Kookiness and Kookiness. chaos. <laughs> yes. Now, we're hearing these sort of arguments that I heard 25 years ago in the Episcopal Church. The German Synod, they say, well, these are basically recommendations. This is the mind of the Synod. Mm -hmm. They don't get put into action unless three quarters or a supermajority. I don't know if it's two thirds or three quarters of the bishops approve it. And each of these had their only need 20 bishops to block this. And each of these votes had uh, more than 20 no's. So the argument is that, uh, well, this will die and won't go any further. And these are just people acting out. Well, we heard that in the Episcopal Church. Once the numbers of bishops chips away, below the 20 mark, these will then be sent to the Vatican for action as mm -hmm. formal recommendations of the wealthiest church, not the largest, but the wealthiest church in the Catholic world. And the German Catholics, like their Episcopal uh, brothers, use money to get their way. Uh, in Germany, they have a church tax, unless you opt out and say you're not a Catholic or a Protestant or whatever, part of your income is sent to the church as a tax. And they have, I mean, this is where, the, the, remember there's a story about the Bishop of Bling, a German bishop who spent millions redecorating his private apartments because there's that money available. Um, and they use this to fund so much of the Vatican's activity, so money talks. So we're seeing um, a foreshadowing, I think, of major changes. And again, Kevin, the history of the Anglican world is that liberals don't get punished, only conservatives do for stepping out of bounds. Mm -hmm. We've we've had reports about uh, an Austrian uh, priest marrying same-sex couples, who's the diocesan youth officer, and what, I think it's diocese of Klagenfurt. We've had uh, German um, rumors of uh, women clergy being ordained surreptitiously uh, in uh, the German-speaking world. And it's the same path the Episcopal Church took. So it's no different. Is, is this mean it going to happen this year? And at the end of the day, it's up to Francis. Yeah. But if you if but if you read the Catholic blogosphere on the traditionalist side, Francis is all in board for all of this stuff they claim. I would say, to we some degree know. or another, he is. You know, but we don't know to what degree that is. Um, I you know, what's it going to what will the Pope, two Popes down from here, be making decisions on? Um, will there be a, a faithful Roman Catholic presence at that time? I don't know. Uh, all I do know well, is if you follow the history of the Episcopal Church, which is in complete shambles right now, uh, it's best to nip this stuff in the bud early on and hold people accountable. 
Just saying. George. Well, the old next... joke is is the old yep. joke was is the Pope Catholic? <laughs> the old joke was is the Pope Catholic? And the answer is of course is the presiding bishop a Christian? The answer is no. <laughs> Not as we understand it. No. On to our next story. Uh, Patriarch Antonio has passed on, and a lot of you aren't going to know who this is. Um, and so George is going to tell us who he is because he was persecuted and held in uh, jail for a long time, and that's where he died, George. Antonius is the patriarch of the was the patriarch of the Eritrean Orthodox Church. Eritrea is a small country in the Horn of Africa that has a Christian majority, Muslim minority, but it is basically a military dictatorship. And when Antonius was consecrated archbishop and primate or patriarch in 2002, uh, yes, 2000, yeah, 2000. Well, whatever. Fifteen years ago. Fifteen years ago. I can't add. I can't add. He was immediately arrested and placed in solitary confinement. He's been in solitary confinement for fifteen years, and he's finally died under house arrest. Now, it wasn't a prison. He was in a uh, house arrest, if you will, but still solitary confinement, unable to worship with others, unable to... He was in prison. Yeah. Um, this is real. Christ- this is the real persecution of Christians, well, where a man. Well, let's just define it. His freedom was taken away from him, and that is prison. That's persecution. Um, when you're not allowed to to worship as you want to worship, to pray as you want to pray, to um, study as you want to study, and to have fellowship with the people you want to have fellowship with, well, that's persecution. And we see this so many parts of the world these days. And I know it's silly to 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 sort of compare Antonius's uh, imprisonment to the rising in religious intolerance in Europe and in America, but it starts somewhere, and it you know eventually winds up with with the jailing of ministers just because they're ministers. Yeah. Um, Eritrea has always been one of those countries, along with North Korea, uh, that and Iran and Afghanistan, where where the I think it's open doors. The people who monitor religious freedom say this is a horrible place for Christians. All right, so let's go to our headline story, which is the director of the Church Society calls for action. He lays out six possible options, including exclusion from the Anglican Communion, which is a change in direction from which the um, Church Society has been operating for a long time, George. And it's the number one story on Anglican.inc. We need to talk about it because uh, Lee uh, Gatiss, friend of Anglican Scripted, friend of Anglican TV, um, and a great leader of evangelism in the Church of England, says, ooh, maybe this isn't working after all something you know I've said a long time ago and it's something we need to talk about because this is kind of what GAFCON has been looking for this is what other branches of um, dissidents of the Church of England have been looking for support in uh, their understanding of what's been happening down on the ground in the Church of England and maybe there can now be an alternative for uh, the Church of England now that Lee Gaddis and others are on board George Yes, but I don't think they're on board the same train as some other people. No. Um, last week, Lee Gaddis released a video which we've posted on Anglican Inc. outlining, uh, the video has a very dull title, and actually it would lead some people when they clicked onto it to think these were arguments in favor of changing the church's teaching on homosexuality. No, far from it. And so we ran an, expl- 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 an explanation story, which sort of goes into what he's saying that was written by Chris Pierce. And Gaddis lays out six, uh, six steps the Church of England can take. And this February 3rd video says, step one is complete, full acceptance of gay marriage in the Church of England. Uh, basically having uh, uh, 
giving the be exactly what they want. Step two is a pastoral accommodation, meaning we don't really change uh, the doctrine on paper, but we say we're not going to marry, but we're going to have a pastoral response and bless, sort of the fudge approach, which was one of the steps the Episcopal Church went through. The third is the status quo. And the status quo is pretty bad, where clergy are forbidden from entering into gay uh, civil partnerships, but it's okay for lay people. And the fourth is no change in doctrine and the enforcement of proper discipline so that people would uh, uh, basically be lose their positions in the church, that the man just appointed, if you will, to be the archbishop, to be the crown nomination committee secretary, the man who basically picks the arch the next bishops, he is in a gay marriage uh, performed in Edinburgh by the Scottish Episcopal Church. He would be lose his job because he is uh, promoting and teaching and living out a theological position at odds with the stated doctrine and discipline of the Church of England. The fifth is uh, in no doctrinal change and basically taking this discipline internationally saying to the Scots and the Welsh and the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church of Anglican Episcopal Church of Brazil. No, we're out of fellowship with you guys because you have adopted these innovations contrary to the mind of the wider communion. And the sixth step that Gaddis says is no call to change. Uh, scam likely, excuse me. Scam, it's probably Justin. Uh, the sixth is no doctrinal change, enforcement of discipline, cracking down internationally, and calling for repentance. Not just saying live and let live, but actively teaching what the Bible says. And Gaddis's argument is that if we have one or two, basically the game is over. It's over immediately if we have one. Mm -hmm. The pastoral accommodation will naturally lead to, to full acceptance. Yep. And if we just continue the status quo, it's going to be undermined from within because there will be bishops, just like in the Episcopal Church, who will do what they want to do and nobody's going to do anything about it. So one, so Gattis, two, and three would lead to destruction here. Not just one and two. Eventually. If Immediate I mean. destruction destruction up that we can see in the future mm -hmm. and an untenable uh, truce that's not going to hold very long right and then there are four then there are three options for basically adopting the conservative line which is proper discipline internally proper discipline internationally discipline discipline and an active call and teaching ministry to repentance of a form of life that is contrary to the gospels the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that those who live and engage in homosexual conduct will not be counted among those found in heaven. And, you know, essentially, uh, are the, is, is the church going to give up on the Bible and fully accommodate itself to the cultures? Are we going to, is the Church of England going to follow the German Catholic Church? Is it going to follow the Episcopal Church? Now, and we know where Gaddis is coming. He's coming down on the M3, sure. which is a bit of a move because the church society had long preached status quo, let's fight from within and we can change. Well, we're seeing a lot, we're seeing strategic defections. Um, the, even, the evangelical side has been deeply, deeply wounded by the Smythe and the Fletcher issues and we're uh well and the Ang anglo catholic side is already does it does barely exist they have no leadership and uh so they they've certainly had a falling out in this but george i think lee missed one here between one and three and between uh four and six right there in the middle uh call it 3a should be mutual flourishing we could be a church where people who disagree with this conduct um, 
have their position and their fellowship and their friendships and people who want to promote and have gay marriages will have their fellowship and their churches and their bishops we'll have a gay bishop you already have gay bishops we'll have straight bishops we'll have flying bishops we'll have mutual flourishing what could go wrong george that's that's got to be the answer here in a perfect world where you have divisions over deep divisions over doctrine and discipline such as as what takes place at holy communion transubstantiation consubstantiation Real zwinglian memorialism yeah all this and that um the uh uh i, I have to stop for say are you hungry because i'm hearing these growling noises that <laughs> you hear that like... so yes. jill has friday off and she goes well i'm going to start the dishwasher no 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 that's too close well, then I'm going to do laundry. Oh, no problem whatsoever. Go do laundry. Well, in an RV, uh, when it hits the spin cycles, <laughs> I'm trying to hold the laptop straight. And, you know, nobody's going to notice that the spin cycle is going, you know? It's, it's a no, little I different. Thought, than, <laughs> I thought you were hungry, Kevin, because no, I no, heard no. these noises, that I these growls. So no, forgive me, what, folks. We don't have a closed studio. And, you know, we have to deal with re recording with life happening. Uh, sometimes George gets an emergency call; he has to take it. Uh, sometimes I get a, a sometimes call. I get a spam call. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's just life. Oh, that's uh, that's RV life. And so this is the first time she's pulled the wash machine thing during a taping. I'm going to say no next time because I know when I'm editing, I'm going to have to use the uh, take out background noise filter on Final Cut Press to uh, to make sure that people only see this; they don't see the hear it. So. Oh, George, life in the RV. So, but back to, no, it, it, yeah, well, back to Lee, Lee Gaddis I just wanna... and, and the, what, his thoughts here. I'm going to say if the Church of England over the last 20 years has put out three or four different reports and they keep having to put out more reports and more commissions and because if they don't answer the way the LGTB people want it, they got to go back to the drawing board. It wasn't good enough. No, we had a great theological paper put out here in 2008 and 2009 on this. Wasn't good enough. Wasn't good enough. We need to do it again. We had the Windsor Report. Nah, not good enough. You know, eh, let's, let's keep trying. So if this isn't the report that the LGBTQ people want, it's back to the drawing board or let's give them a little bit, George. Let's just give, let's have, let's give them a little bit. And at the same time as this came out, the Church of England Evangelical Council released a statement saying that if the uh, LLF, uh, I always have to look up what it means, living in love and fellowship or faithfulness, whatever, mm -hmm. what to do, uh, you know, how do we go forward on gay marriage? The Church of England Evangelical Council, which too also up until recently has promoted the stay and fight within, as saying, if we go down this road to apostasy, we have to reconsider if we're going to be in or out. So the question I have, Kevin, is why do you think the Church Society and the Church of Even England Evangelical Council has all of a sudden, what's happened to make them realize that uh, things have reached a point where they have to be this clear? Well, there's two choices. One, what, they oh. caught up on the 700 episodes of Anglican Unscripted, or they're starting to, to see that there's just no way forward other than the quagmire. You know, they call it the status quo. It's not the status quo. The status quo here is losing uh, because you look at the practice, not just the position. Yeah, the doctrine's fine, but look what the Church of England is promoting within. And all you see is middle management. You have gay bishops. And if you have a gay bishop, you can have a Brexit bishop. And if you can have a Brexit bishop, you can certainly have a COVID bishop. If you can have a COVID bishop, well, you could probably have an airline bishop. And if you can have, th there's just no end. To middle management, but to, to I think they need a Starlink bishop. You know, and so there's just no and an internet bishop. There's just no end to the amount of bishops you can have once you start to go down this middle management road. And if you if you're the church society, if you're the evangelicals in the, the church of England, you're like it's lost. Every priest who cannot operate a parish, who is a destruction since they left seminary must be taken out of the parish and put somewhere at the middle management bishop level. That's why we have COVID bishops, George. And uh, 
Our, our last story is talking about uh, what a well, real bishop uh, should do, but it's crazy. Let me sort of circle back around again um, mm -hmm. and sort of talk about what I'm here, what I'm hearing. Um, one of the things I've noticed is that the opposition, the liberals, have become harder and harder and harder and nastier and nastier and nastier. Once upon a time, I could sit down with Colin Coward, who was then one of the leaders of the gay and lesbian Christian movement, and we could have a wonderful evening chatting, having fun, this and that, mm -hmm. uh, at these events. If you read some of Colin's uh, recent writings, it's that if you don't agree with us, you should get out of the church. Uh, one of the most extreme person of consequence in the Church of England on this issue is Jan Oz Jane Ozan, mm -hmm. who in some of her recent writings is basically threatening criminal prosecution to those who pray for those who wish to be delivered from same-sex orientation and attractions, who seeks, who, you know, some of these people like Ozan who believe in a witchcraft of forms, that words have a magical power that uh, I can say this spell, and if I say uh, he instead of they, or misgender somebody, I'm committing a thought crime, which is well, just as bad as a physical crime. The, and Jane, this culture Jane, war crap is coming to the church. It is, but Jane's biggest problem is prayer does work. Not magic mm -hmm. prayers, not magic work, but they would never, ever, ever complain about the prayers if they didn't work. And you and I, we know people, we've heard the testimonies of those who came for help for same-sex attraction and were delivered. We also know those who came for help and were not delivered. You know? oh, Kevin, I, I, I agree with you on, on part of what you say, but I also would argue that she would still complain even if they didn't because they seek to control all thought mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and yes. they seek to destroy what they consider bad thought. And I think the people in the Church of England are working up to the fact that on the conservative side is that the opposition is getting nastier and nastier and nastier. And if you only listen to what they really are saying about you, they don't want you to flourish. They don't want you around. No. Um, and you have to then start thinking, well, what do we do in these circumstances? Now, Neither the CEC or the Church Society have said, okay, then now we're all in on GAFCON and AMA. Nothing like that has happened. But they seem to have a, well, here's one of the little inside tips, whether it's true or not, I'm not certain, that, uh, oh, it's a wonderful washing machine. I can tell you, Kevin, the noises we're hearing over the computer are just fantastic. But um, no. Uh, I, think it's done. I think it's done now. That was the final vault gird of the, the Washington. The Archbishop of York, Stephen Cottrell, is, is emerging as the man behind the throne, the man with the power in the Church of England hierarchy. Welby, within the church world, is shoddy goods. He shot his bolt. Think of all the little truisms, analogies you want to say. Mm -hmm. But Welby is not the force that he once was. He's ridiculous. Cottrell is the one given the responsibilities for the main things for the future, um, the various processes. The head of the CEC, the new head of the CEEC, comes out of Chelmsford Diocese. And so he was there when uh, Cottrell said, if you don't like it, leave. Cottrell is denied saying that, but he said it in front of the clergy and, you know, he's denying it for PC reasons, but they've heard it before. And so the man who's moving fastest up the ladder, Cottrell, who's basically now pulling the strings, has basically already said, we're going to get you. And what I think we're going to see as an intermediate step is I think we're going to see the resurrection of the third province argument. We've got Canterbury, we've got York, we're going to have to have a third province outside of the current diocesan structures and systems for those who cannot go along with the the trajectory of the national church hierarchy and part of the not outright condemnation 
of this new plan that Welby is putting out, which you mentioned, Bishop for Brexit, Bishop for this, Bishop for that, getting rid of a lot of dioceses, merging and amalgamating and consolidating and having basically numerous archbishops over regional areas and this and that. It's if you're going to redo the whole structure of the church, that's now is the only time that you're going to be able to get a third province, which with its own clergy, its own seminaries, its own prayer books, this and that and the other. And so my take, if you will, sense is that the CEEC, the Church Society, and some other conservatives see an opportunity in the chaos. Perhaps it's a good thing that Michael Nazarelli and the old leadership are gone, that Fletcher uh, has destroyed the old leadership's credibility in the evangelical movement. New voices are arising. Lee Gaddis, who's younger than we are, is now a person of significance. The CEEC people are rising up and the old guys who were the, sort of keeping a lid on things saying, just play the game, play the playing, play the game. Four of them have gone to the Catholic Church in the last year. Others have retired. Others have not wanted to fight anymore. So it's next So the next generation is rising and they see their opportunity to strike. Well, Welby's weak, while Cottrell is trying to uh, cons take away as much power as he can within the church institutions from Welby and his team, now's the time to come in and strike their deal. It's amazing. It yeah, mm -hmm. I know. It's amazing to see how many pensioners, once they retire, want to move on to the Roman Catholic Church. And they don't they don't they don't leave before they get their pension, but you know, it is what it is. Well here's the funny <laughs> thing. If the uh, the English Catholic Church is not as advanced as the German Catholic Church on some of these issues, but there's a good segment of the English Catholic Church that despises these Anglican converts. Yeah. They look at them as being people who are going to wrest the church away from them, their complete control. So it's not always great grass is not if you if you truly believe the doctrines of the Catholic Church, uh, the specific doctrines that they alone should have, then by all means go there. But if you're doing it because the grass is greener, friends, it's not any greener <laughs> no. on that side of the fence. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, not just for the stuff we report, but also for the stuff we don't report. But uh, let's move on to our final story. And this whole episode, 717, has been about bishops in the Episcopacy and what doesn't work and what's not working. I want to talk a little bit about good bishops once in a while and we have lots of lots of we have several good bishops in the uh, acna my bishop uh, i consider to be a good bishop because he's always calling uh the priests that are under him i'll be trying to have a conversation or meet with my my priest or whatever and it's another phone call from his bishop just saying hey I was thinking about you. How you doing? How's your wife? How's your family? Did you ever solve this family issue? That type of thing. Good communication between uh, the bishop and the priest is essential uh, for a healthy diocese. And you put up a obituary of Bill Fowl, who is a former bishop here of uh, Central Florida, and you put uh, links to it on Facebook. And I'm watching clergy who were under him say, he used to call me all the time. And I'm like, ah, we got another good one. Let's talk about uh, Bill Fowl, George. Bill Falwell was bishop from 1970 to 1989 at the Diocese of Central Florida. Now, he was a creature of his time. He was against women, bish uh, women clergy at the beginning. He then flipped and he then was for it towards the end of his time. And he had some fights with a few clergy who wouldn't accept his change. So I'm not saying the man's perfect in all things. Yeah. But what Bill Falwell did, I'm told, because 89 was before my time as a priest, Bill Falwell made a habit of calling each of his clergy at least once a month. Now, wasn't to check up what was attendance on Sunday, how you, you know, what was collections, but rather, how are you doing? What's going on in your life? What can we issues? If you know, if the issue was church, he'd talk about church. If the issue were your children, he'd talk about his children. Bill Falwell was a pastor to his priests. Uh, since 1989, there's not been a bishop like that in Central Florida. I, uh, you know, when I was paralyzed 
for those who watched our show early on remember me and our neck brace Mm -hmm. i was hospitalized and in a nursing home and i had a miserable time for a long time i never got a call from uh, john howe uh i got a i got a very from the can of the ordinary sure but uh you know i i see my bishop current bishop once every three three and a half years when he comes to visit and from afar at diocesan convention you know that the last two bishops here have not really been pastors to all the clergy um they they do have a, a different are, they have other skill sets but other skill sets yeah John Howe was a very orthodox man, wonderful preacher. Greg Brewer is an orthodox man, again, a very good preacher and musician. Uh, but neither would I say were they touchy-feely pastoral types. Now, that's a, that's a derogatory way of describing it. Well, uh, people, uh, people, people. In defense, were their bishops touchy-feely? You know, I, I, I don't ever want to pin this, well, you weren't touchy-feely. They just never learned what it means to be a good bishop other than, well, I guess I have to I have to protect the church against erroneous doctrine. Yes, yes, you do. No, absolutely. That's one of your jobs as, as a, a bishop. I need to uh, uh, be there for confirmations and baptisms and, and keep the, the system going. Yes, that's that's another thing. But you, all, you need to be uh, the, the senior pastor senior clergy, senior uh, um, person of, of this diocese who's going to be always communicating and loving and knowing what's going on in the lives of your priest. Uh, that's kind and of your this, flock here. Yeah. And this really doesn't have that much to do with theology. Mm-hmm. P- Peter Selby is the former Bishop of Worcester in the Church of England, and he's as left as they come. Um, but he was renowned for being a kind, caring, compassionate uh, a pastor to his clergy of all stripes. Uh, Keith Ackerman mm-hmm. uh, in the Episcopal Church and John Guernsey in the Anglican Church of North, North America. Sure. Here we have a liberal, an evangelical, and an Anglo-Catholic. And there are others I don't wish to, by omission, I am not criticizing. No. But here, here are three people who have a wonderful reputation as being genuinely interested and praying for and with their clergy. And I didn't know Bill Falwell, but I really do wish, uh, I don't wish I was older, but I do wish that uh, that sort of tradition were kept alive in the church. Because what we're seeing right now with this management culture nonsense, that's not going any, that's being almost derided. It is that, because uh, would my would my climate change bishop ever call me? I doubt it. Bishop, my brother. Gavin Ashenden. Yeah. Gavin Ashenden has a little anecdote which I'd love to repeat, um, and so I'm going to steal it from him. But it does star Gavin Ashenden. <laughs> Gavin was uh, head hunted uh, as a younger man for the episcopate and for being the uh, person who sort of trains and looks out for higher office dealing sure. with bishops. And one of the things he was asked is, uh, what would the first thing you would do uh, when, you know, once you were bishop? He said, I'd have, a, I'd have clergy over to my house, have cocoa or tea, and sing Christmas carols. Or uh, things, you know, and the, the, interviewers look, the interviewers looked at him like, you're, you're a loon. I mean, this is not what a bishop does. A bishop is on committees. A bishop writes reports. A bishop talks to other bishops. He doesn't have people in his house and sing Christmas carols or Gilbert and Sullivan uh, and drink cocoa. And of course, Gavin didn't become a bishop in the Church of England because they don't want his sort, I guess. Touchy but, feeling. Uh, they don't I, like touchy I, feeling. I, or pastoral or fathers in God. Uh, they don't want that. No, indeed. All right, I think we've talked this subject uh, to death here. We're going on 50 minutes. Uh, now, I'm going to be available Tuesday. What's your schedule look like, George? Get our calendars I'll out. I'll be here on Tuesday. All right, good, 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 good. Uh, Kevin, I do yeah. want to say... Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry. Never mind. <laughs> Washington's birthday is the 22nd. 
And I still am not over the fact that they combine Lincoln's birthday and Washington's birthday to make President's Day. Yeah. Because there are some presidents that I'm not going to celebrate as a holiday. But I, but I still want to take off Washington's birthday and Lincoln's birthday, which is oh, tomorrow, totally by the way. Yeah, it birthday. is. Hey, little trivia for you. Don't Google it. But if you know it, go to the comments and tell me which presidents died on July 4th and which presidents were born on July 4th. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conga, and you've been watching episode 717 of Anglican Unscripted.